This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream. What shape is formed by taking a diagonal slice of a four-dimensional cube? Or a 10-dimensional cube? It turns out that a very familiar mathematical object, Pascal's triangle, can help us answer this question. Pascal's triangle forms a sort of hierarchy, and we construct the lower levels from the upper ones. Normally, those levels are comprised of numbers, which we add together. But we'll look at a geometric analog, where we'll be adding shapes. But before we get to that, we'll need to define hypercubes and hyperplanes. Normally, we think of a cube as being three-dimensional, like this. But a square is basically a two-dimensional cube, and a one-dimensional cube is just a line segment. And in four dimensions, well, that's harder to describe intuitively. People sometimes call a four-dimensional cube a tesseract, one of my favorite math words. And in higher dimensions, we sometimes use the word hypercube. Let's give a definition for a cube that works in all dimensions. First, Remember that the points in n dimensions are specified by n coordinates. The vertices of a cube are all the points where the coordinates are either 0 or 1, like 0, 1, 0, 0 in 4 dimensions or 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0 in 7 dimensions. The cube is all those vertices plus all the stuff between the vertices, what's known as the convex hull. OK, now. What's a hyperplane? In general, it's a space one dimension smaller than the one you're currently thinking about. So in one dimension, a line, the hyperplane is zero dimensional, a point. In two dimensions, a plane, the hyperplane is one dimensional, a line. In three dimensions, the hyperplane is a regular old 2D plane. In four dimensions, the hyperplane is three dimensional and so on. If we look at the intersection of a hyperplane with an object, like a hypercube, which is kind of like taking a slice out of it, we can sometimes understand different features of that object. Let's start slicing cubes, beginning with a square. We'll draw a diagonal from 0, 0 to 1, 1. Then we draw the hyperplane that's perpendicular to this diagonal going through 0, 0. Remember, it's one dimension smaller, so it's a line. And then we sweep this line up along the diagonal, up to the point 1, 1. Let's pause the picture every time the hyperplane hits a vertex of the square. That's when we'll be taking slices of the square. This happens three times. At the very beginning, at 0, 0, in the middle, when it hits 1, 0, and 0, 1, and at the end, when it hits 1, 1. Let's look at the intersection of the hyperplane with the square at each of those points. At the first and last moments, the hyperplane just hits the square at a point. But in the middle, it's a line segment. Let's try the whole thing again in three dimensions. Here's the diagonal line from the corner 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1. Now, Let's draw the hyperplane that's perpendicular to this diagonal going through 0, 0, 0. This time, it's a 2D plane. Like before, we sweep this plane along the diagonal up to the point 1, 1, 1. There are four separate times in which the sweeping plane intersects the vertices of the cube. First, it starts at 0, 0, 0. Then, it hits three vertices at once, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and 0, 1, 0. Then it hits three more vertices at once, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and 0, 1, 1. And finally, it ends at 1, 1, 1. Again, underneath, we'll record the shape of the intersection of the hyperplane and the cube. At the first and last intersections, it's a point. But the middle two intersections are both triangles, with one pointing up and one pointing down. This even works in one dimension. A one-dimensional cube is a line segment, and the hyperplane is just a point. In one dimension, we run this point along the line segment, and it intersects the vertices twice, once at the beginning and once at the end. Let's summarize these results. 
Here's the shape of the hyperplane intersection when you sweep it across the diagonal of a cube and pause at vertices. The most logical question to ask now is what's on the next line? What happens when you sweep a three-dimensional hyperplane through a four-dimensional cube? To help answer this question, we need to talk about Pascal's triangle and explicitly recognize the version of Pascal's triangle that's emerging from this picture. Pascal's triangle is an infamous object in mathematics that shows up in many unexpected places. It's defined in terms of the number of unique combinations of things. This notation indicates the number of distinct ways to choose k objects from a collection of n objects. We usually say it as n choose k. For example, 5 choose 2 is 10. If you have 5 puppies and have to select your favorite 2, there are 10 ways to do that. If you're not allowed to take any puppies home, there's only one way to do that. So 5 choose 0 is 1. There's a formula for n choose k. It's n factorial divided by k factorial times n minus k factorial, but the formula is not important for our purposes. One way to describe Pascal's triangle is to say that on the nth row, the entry in the kth column is n choose k, as in the third column on the fifth row is five choose three. We always start counting with zero, so this is the zeroth row, and each row has a zeroth column. So to find the fifth row third column, we actually count 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 rows and 0, 1, 2, 3 entries. So if we use the formula for choose, Pascal's triangle becomes this. Compare it with the picture of cube slices. Amazingly, the number of vertices within each cube slice directly corresponds to Pascal's triangle. And that's not just a coincidence of the first few rows. The pattern holds for all the rows below. To explain why this happens, let's first focus on the three-dimensional case. The slices of the 3D cube are a point, a triangle, another triangle, and another point. So the number of vertices these slices have are 1, 3, 3, 1, which corresponds to the third row in Pascal's triangle. The first diagonal slice intersects one vertex, 0, 0, 0. It corresponds to 3 choose 0, because there are three coordinates and zero of them are ones. The next diagonal slice goes through 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. It corresponds to 3 choose 1, because there are three coordinates and one of them is a 1. The vertices correspond to all the ways to choose the position of 1, 1 among the three coordinates. The next diagonal slice, corresponding to 3 choose 2, contains all the vertices with exactly two ones, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and 0, 1, 1. The final slice, corresponding to 3 choose 3, contains all the vertices with exactly three ones, which is just 1, 1, 1. What does that tell us about the four-dimensional case? The first diagonal slice will only contain the vertex 0, 0, 0, 0. The next diagonal slice, corresponding to 4 choose 1, will contain all the vertices with 1, 1. The middle diagonal slice, 4 choose 2, will contain 6 vertices, each with 2 ones. The next diagonal slice, 4 choose 3, will contain 4 vertices, each with 3 ones. And the final slice is just the vertex with all ones, 1, 1, 1, 1. In general, the number of vertices of the diagonal slices of an n-dimensional cube are n choose 0, n choose 1, and so on, up to n choose n. The n choose k entry corresponds to the slice which goes through all the vertices whose coordinates have k many ones and n minus k zeros. So this analogy with Pascal's triangle tells us how many vertices the kth diagonal slice of an n-dimensional cube will have. But can it also tell us what shape those vertices make? For example, we just learned the middle slice of the 4D cube has six vertices. We also know those six vertices will make some three-dimensional object, since it's a 3D slice of a 4D cube. But there's a lot of ways to arrange six vertices in three dimensions, like this or this. How do we know what shape they make? Here's where Pascal's rule can help us. Pascal's rule 
tells us that each entry of Pascal's triangle is the sum of the entry to its upper right and its upper left. For example, four choose two is equal to three choose one plus three choose two. Here's the general statement. There's actually an analogous version for cube slices. We can obtain a slice by geometrically adding the two slices above it. For example, the middle slice of a 2D cube is a line segment. The slices above it are both single points. Here's how we add the single points to get the line segment. Place the single points directly on top of each other and fill in the space between them. This produces a line segment. Let's try it again. The second slice of a three-dimensional cube is a triangle. It's produced by geometrically adding the line segment and vertex above it. The top and bottom face of a 3D cube are both 2D cubes. Place the two slices we are combining on these two faces. Now, draw lines between the vertices and fill it in. This is the convex hull, which in this case is a triangle. So, back to the question from the very beginning. What do the diagonal slices of a 4D cube look like? We can repeat the same procedure we just did. The top and bottom faces of a 4D cube are 3D cubes. We already know this slice is made from four vertices, but now we can tell exactly what it looks like. It's the convex hull of a triangle and a vertex placed on their respective locations within the 3D faces. So it makes a regular tetrahedron. Similarly, we already knew this slice is made from six vertices, but now we know it's the convex hull of the two triangles, each properly positioned within the top and bottom face. This makes a regular octahedron. So, taking the three-dimensional hyperplane and sweeping it diagonally across a four-dimensional cube, we encounter these five slices, a vertex, a tetrahedron, an octahedron, another tetrahedron, and another vertex. Now, you have all the tools necessary to construct the four-dimensional slices of a five-dimensional cube. The hard part is visualizing the shapes in four dimensions. See you next time on Infinite Series. This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers unlimited access to documentaries and nonfiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. It's available in 196 countries worldwide. I'm looking forward to learning about Henry V. For our audience, the first two months are free if you sign up at curiositystream.com infinite and use the promo code infinite during the sign up process. Hello. There were so many wonderful comments in response to our Devil's Staircase video. I want to first start with a clarification. I said that the Cantor set includes all of the numbers whose base three expansion contains no ones. That's correct, but we have to remember that you can write any terminating one as a repeating two. So like in base 10, a lot of people know that you can write one as 0.9 repeating. You can do the same thing in base three, except instead of 0.9 repeating, you use 0.2 repeating. And using that little modification, we can say that the Cantor set is all of the numbers whose base three expansion contains no ones. So thanks for pointing that out in the comments. Next, a lot of people ask whether the Cantor function has a derivative. That's a great question. It is a continuous function, but not all continuous functions have derivatives. And in fact, the Cantor function does have a derivative at all the points that aren't in the Cantor set. And there, its derivative is zero. On the points that are in the Cantor set, the Cantor function does not have a derivative. It's just not defined. All right, finally, for our challenge winner, we have Athman, who gave a great proof of the uncountability of the Cantor set. And what I really like about this proof is that it spawned a ton of discussion and there was some corrections made and people worked through the problem together. And it's just, it's a really nice discussion, not just the comment itself, but everything that comes under it. So I highly recommend you read it. Okay, have a good week.